very pleased to be here. It's my first time in India. Um, and I'm from England, but I'm living in the Netherlands. Um, this is about the Agile Mindset. Um, it's in five parts. Is this okay? A bit higher? Okay. Can you hear me okay? Um, but I want to ask a few questions about you just before I get started so that I can get a, a kind of feeling of the situation and the, that you're working in. Um, so are you working, if you're working virtually in your team or with other teams, put your hand up. Okay. Um, if you're in a new team, put your hand up. Are you working in cross-functional teams? Anyone? Oh. Um, Post-merger acquisition environments? Um, going through change, deep change. Any kind of change. All right, okay. Um, and then in terms of your relationship with agility, welcome, please come in. I think I All right. I think you can hear me anyway. All right. So in terms of where you are with agility, who would say that they are just in a position of learning about agile? Okay, so if you... And what about people who are in the, in the position of transitioning to agile with a team? Okay, and then working in an agile team that's actively agile right now? Okay. Um, what about um, working in agile ways with other teams as well? Okay, so that's cross-functional team people putting their hands up again. And then leading agile. Who's leading agile? Who's consulting, coaching agile? Okay. All right, so there's a pretty much a spread in the room. Um, I'm going to start by telling you a story. Um, and I'm not from an agile background myself. Last time I said this in a room of agile people, everyone went... <gasps> because I, I used to come from corporate communications. Oh. But don't worry, I'm out now. Um, and I want to start with a story about um, when I first graduated. I started working for small businesses and just teams of 10. And when you're in a team of 10, you can get really, really tight on who is working with who, 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 what are we supposed to be doing? How is that going? Um, how are... Please, yeah, just come in, take a seat. Um, you can get really tight on who is who and what are we doing and how did we do it and what are we then changing? And I worked with two or three organizations and after a while I started um, getting quite a lot of experience in the marketing side of things and PR. And then somebody said to me, look, you could be a really good communications consultant in an oil and gas consultancy in the Netherlands. And so we're going to send you out there. And I was like, wow, you know, this is the big league. Okay, so I'm going to join a blue chip international organization. They're going to fly me out there, put me up in a hotel. And I couldn't wait to find out what are they doing so well to be making so much money. So I went out and I was, you know, completely blown away. First couple of months, there's this massive budgets, huge people capabilities. Um, governance, there's job descriptions, there's strategy processes. It's really, really awesome. But at the same time, I'm working in a team. The team is 17 people. I'm in a communications capacity. And it just feels really foggy. It's like different people are in different meetings at different times, being exposed to different kinds of um, different documents. Um, they've got different ways of looking at things. It's almost like you can't get that clarity you can't get that sort of tight feeling as a team where you're really clear on what's happening and what needs to be done. And it started bugging me because I sort of felt a responsibility to do something about this. I felt, um, I felt really like, as a communications person, how could I possibly assist this team if I'm not myself clear on the perspectives going on in the team? And I found that it was really, the word that I kind of used was ambiguous. So it actually took me two years of thinking, by this time, I joined this organization as a member of staff. I was working in the Global Learning Organization. And it took me two years of thinking, is this just me, something that I need to learn because I've never worked in a big, massive organization before? And after a while, the word ambiguity came up. It's ambiguous. It's difficult to, to, really, to really know what's going on. So I went to somebody senior in the learning organization 
an approachable guy, and I said, look, you know, what is this with this sort of unclarity? It, it really doesn't feel like everyone is on the same page. He said, yes, it is ambiguity. And I was like, yes, it is ambiguity. And he said, you know what? We feel that ambiguity is something that is, um, if you can tolerate ambiguity, it's like a leadership strength. So I kind of said thank you and walked away and thought, all right, so does that mean I'm never going to be a leader because I'm finding it difficult to tolerate ambiguity? So I left it and I carried on. And as I carried on, I got to learn more about other people in communications and other people in projects, realizing it's not just me. And I thought, you know what? There is unavoidable ambiguity, for sure. We're in a VUCA world, it's all very complex. Unavoidable ambiguity is always out there. But there's a lot of avoidable ambiguity that people are just being, you could say, lazy about, or they're using it as an excuse, or maybe they don't even see it. But it's there. And everybody's making masses of micro decisions every day and taking actions every day. And the ambiguity isn't helping with that. It's frustrating people. It's making people work in different directions. And it's costing a lot of money. So what is this? And what, why does nobody seem to be acknowledging this? So let's look at the current situation. So we know that the world is getting more complex. That's not news. There is more to align on. So as teams are in situations where they're in merger situations, cross-team situations, things are changing rapidly, there's more things for people to actually look at and, and, and be on the same page about. You've probably heard the stats about um, disengagement or employer disengagement, where the onus of responsibility is on the manager, but they don't seem to be doing much about it, and more and more people are becoming less engaged with their organization. So that's an issue that's just there. And then at the same time, companies are putting in SharePoint, Yammer, all of these kind of information sharing platforms and hoping that, gets, that fixes it. And I'd say that that helps people connect with other people, it helps people share information, but it doesn't fix ambiguity. Okay. Now I'm going to show you a fairly wordy slide and I'm going to read everything on this slide because it's really good at explaining this problem. So this is a piece of research from 2005. It's from a business process management journal. And it says that problems caused by misalignment include confusion, waste of time, money and opportunity, diminished productivity, demotivation of individuals and teams. So that's, I think we kind of recognize when that happens. But it's about internal conflicts, power struggles and project failure. But this is it, as well as resulting in time and energy spent doubting, conspiring, guessing or gossiping. That's what happens when people are in situations that they can't make sense of. When that same energy could be deployed in moving an organization forward. And this is the sort of problem statement that I'm going to put out there about what, what we're calling it, the fog, that I think a lot of people recognize. But a lot of people call it just life. Okay, I'm going to move on. Let's look at the future. More diverse teams, more cross-functional teams, more, virtu more, more people working in different places, short-term staff, freelance staff. This is the way it's all going. People aren't even going to be given the opportunity to meet or get to know each other or actually figure out what gender of somebody they're, they're talking to, potentially. While at the same time, the need for niche and tailored product, products and the need for accelerated learning and innovation and performance is only going to increase. So that kind of invisible misalignment is going to be more and more imp important and more and more relevant. So this kind of stuff isn't just about, you know, the employee experience and helping people to feel better at work and sort of the soft stuff that's, that inevitably becomes deprioritized. It's actually getting alignment right is more about a source of competitive advantage in terms of in, uh, performance, in terms of innovation, in terms of reputation and sustainability. So people in internal communications and HR groups and learning groups are kind of talking about the need to get better at this generally. People in projects, people in management positions, they're talking about how to be more agile, how people can get better on the same page. But it's still not on the map, really, is it? Misalignment is just a word. It's just like, yeah, we're, they weren't very misaligned. So what is going on? And I would say the reason for this is it's like dark matter. Okay, misalignment is sort of invisible. It's everywhere. And it's 
ever so important and ever so powerful, but we don't really understand it yet. So when I start talking to leases and managers, and by this time I've moved on to a role in a global telecoms company, when I start talking to leaders and managers about looking at this and recognizing it and doing something about it, the sort of responses I get are, well, yeah, this is impossible to manage, you know, it's just life. Uh, we're busy with other priorities, um, you know, we've just got to get on with it. And we don't have the capability. Well, I say, that's rubbish, because if we can drill oil out of the ground in hostile environments, and if we can figure out what our customers are thinking and feeling and wanting, and if we can organize ourselves, organize ourselves the way that we are being organized today, surely we can get on top of this challenge, right? And I'm starting to get annoyed about it because it's getting in my, in my way as a communicator. And it's making the communications work or the work of everybody else less efficient. It's boring. It's frustrating. So I want to get under the skin of this, like really get under the skin of this and talk to you about this today. And it's going to be um, a, a kind of little bit interactive as we go along. So how do we see things differently? Why does this even happen? Where does alignment even come from? Why don't we just have concepts that match and then we get it? it why isn't it more transactional? Well, here's a phrase that occurred um, in another company I worked in. This actually came down from the top. We're going to go digital. OK. Somebody says, all right, there's a change coming up. Somebody else is thinking, well, this has got to be a marketing thing. Somebody else is saying, well, this has got to be about a new platform for customers or something. Um, somebody else is saying, well, it must be an acquisition or a merger because we don't have any capabilities like this right now. So everybody's looking at this from a different point. And actually, the interesting thing about it is that all of those people looking at it are completely disabled because they don't have the clarity on what's necessary or how this affects their job or how it's relevant to them as a person. They just know that something's happening. So they're completely disempowered from taking any action. So in terms of the way that people look at things differently, what I want you to do is turn to somebody next to you. So I'm going to ask you to get into pairs. This is just going to take a couple of minutes. So find somebody next to you. Look somebody in the eye. That's going to, somebody's going to be A. Somebody's going to be B. And I'm going to ask person A to turn around and put their back to the screen. OK, so. We're going to do that right now. So please, can person A not see the screen? I want to see half of you with backs to the screen. Good. So do not look at the screen. Person A, do not look at the screen. Person B, I'm going to give you, I'm going to put an image onto the screen and I'm going to ask you to describe the image to the person who cannot see the screen and I'm going to give you one minute. So when you, when you do this, I want the other person to see exactly what you're telling them to see. So are you ready? Okay, so starting three, two, one, you've got one minute. You got thirty seconds. Fifteen seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, stop. All right, okay, so the person who had their back to the screen can now look at the screen. You can't see the screen. <laughs> okay, so, you know, it's a fairly complicated image. Did the person B say that there were three parts to the image? Yes. Yes. Good, that's the easy bit. Did they describe the dimensions of those parts? 
When you turned around, did you have this image in mind? No. Of course, it's impossible. But, you know, in non-transactional environments where it's not circle equals circle, where things are complex and more conceptual, it's almost impossible to be able to describe something to somebody and have them see it exactly the way you see it or exactly the way that you verbalize it because of the limits of language. Okay, any other insights or things that happened during that little exercise? No, okay. So the reason why people see things differently and what's behind what we're what I'm now referring to as the fog, so this, this ambiguity I'm talking about, is these things, because we're all so human. We all have our biases. We all have our assumptions. We all have diversity, and diversity is a strength, of course, but mostly it's a weakness. It's difficult to manage diversity. Diversity means that we just interpret the world differently and we have a different set of rules. We actually understand things differently, and we misunderstand things, and we have environmental influences. When's the last time somebody said to you, well, we're not going to go to that meeting? And then you thought, well, I'm going to go anyway. Well, maybe you do or you don't, but either way, you're being influenced by people around you all the time. And um, let me put it differently then. Just a quick visual explanation. We have a radar. Let's say your radar starts with facts that you know. Sorry if you can't see the screen. Maybe you have to move a little bit. Um, and then there's interpretations that you make. And then there's assumptions that you make, and then things that you know you don't know. And maybe your radar looks like this, where you're very knowledgeable. So you have this sort of view on the world, and maybe you're working with somebody, and they have their view on the world, and so does the other, other person and the other person again. So here's your whole reality. Say, as a team of just four people, you have this whole reality together, but the bit that you share is only that big. So what's in the middle? What's between it? This is just a way of explaining it. It's that fog that we're talking about, all of these assumptions and things that may not be clear. Now, you don't need to clear all the fog, of course, but let me give you some examples. So perhaps this person is saying, well, we need to improve quality. Why isn't this a higher priority? Well, if that person doesn't say anything, they'll be making decisions and they'll be taking actions based on their belief that quality should be a higher priority, even though maybe they're trying not to. And their teammates won't benefit from their view as to why quality should be a high priority. And that person won't benefit from the view that is explaining why there is a different priority in place. It's just a gap. That's fine, there's a gap. But if you add up other gaps, we need way more data to know we're making the right decision. So there is actually a profile of, of a group of people who prefer to have more data before making decisions. Now, if that person... That person could be managing a team of 20 people, and they might send them off for two months going to gather data about something, at the worst case scenario, when perhaps the rest of the team that they're in feel that that's not necessary and it's holding them up. That's, that's potentially a huge gap. He isn't taking the time to listen, so he's obviously not interested in my views or doesn't think they're worth much. Well, this is a bit more difficult because it's a bit more potentially political, a bit more social. Maybe he doesn't want to listen to her views. Now, that's a gap that's difficult to fix. Maybe he does think they're worth much, but he's just too busy. But again, it's a gap. So she might say, well, there's no point in me telling him then. So she's then going to hold back what she's thinking because she doesn't think he wants to know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, this is difficult to get on top of, but that's what this is all about. And I want to now come to um, some research about what's behind the fog and uh, what's going on with it to explain um, a little bit more about how we how we get to unravel it. Yeah. Yes, they will be. So there's a piece of research right back from 1972 in the social sciences. I've been working with the Technical University of Delft um, to, to look at all of this literature. And the most interesting piece, I mean, there's tons of it, of course, but the most in interesting piece is, is, is this, called social constructionism, all right? It basically means that the way that people create their understanding of reality is through language with people. I mean, obviously, the written language is another way that they soak up information. But its con meaning is constructed between people. The second bit of research is about learning behaviors, much more recent. Um, 2010, 
um, a researcher from um, Eindhoven University, now moved to Antwerp University, talks about how learning behaviours in four categories help people to forge a better shared understanding. What I mean by that is, so we've all seen, uh, you've probably heard mo a lot about psychological safety. So for example, if, if psychological safety is present in the room here, I will feel safe being myself and saying something without fear of being reprimanded for it or punished for, for what I'm thinking or saying. Therefore, I feel more comfortable in the room. I'm more likely to listen to other people who also feel safe. Therefore, we're more likely, if we were talking, we'd be more likely to build a better shared understanding because our, our communication is open and respectful. So, psychological safety is about trust, effectively. Task cohesion is about how much people are committed to working together as a team. Group potency is how much confidence people feel in achieving their shared goals. And then interdependence is how much you can rely on each other to deliver to each other. And, you know, Google did a lot of research about this and they found that trust was in fact the number one factor behind effective teams. So you could say that effective teams is about the right learning behaviours that lead to a better shared understanding that allow people to take actions and decisions which make them together more effective. So it's all quite logical, but it's nice to know that the behaviours and the understanding piece are, are the same. But there's one more piece. So the piece that most teams can't control for themselves is the support from the organisation that they're in, like the culture of the wider organisation. Um, the extent to which people feel rewarded and recognised for good work. Um, the extent to which stakeholders who, in, who in, uh, relate to their teams um, do that effectively. So there's a whole load of things outside of the influence of the team themselves that will affect how effective they are. So this is the actual model. Now let me come back to the problem at hand. And it was articulated really well um, in one of these research papers that summarised and says teams are more effective than individuals. We know this. But effective collaboration isn't the case of putting the right people together with the right skills bunging them all in a room, virtual or not, and then expecting them to be effective. Because people face the challenge of integrating their perspectives and collaborating because of all of the things we're talking about. The diversity, the assumptions, the, the, the way that people um, interpret things, the way that their biases. Actually integrating as a single unit is a challenge. And I'm going to unpack this a little bit more. I'm not going to go back to 1972. I'm really going to unpack this now. And I'm going to go back to 8000 BC. Bear with me. There is a book, and it's a very good book, by Frederick Leloux, who talks about the evolution of organizations. And this will speak a lot to where Agile has, why Agile has evolved. But right back to 8000 BC, communities of, say, hundreds or just a thousand people were managed by a hero ruler. So it was egocentric, individualistic, power to one person. And that one person would dictate what he needed to happen and when. It was to enforce social order and protect people from wars or invasion from other communities. And it worked. Let me fast forward now to 1000 BC. And you have more of an organized machine. You've got stratified social classes. You've got the beliefs of right or wrong. Think about the Catholic Church. Think about the army. People were split into doing different tasks, which meant that you had to, had to have different levels of managers manage them. And there were replicable, pro replicable processes and hierarchies in place that meant that um, this organized machine um, protected people, again, from threats at that time. The lines of power and the lines of communication are coming top down. Fast forward now to, to 1950. Think about General Motors in the US. It's a cog, it's a machine, it's massive and it's magnified this. Lots of different tasks are managed by lots of different managers and this time it's a meritocracy because they need more people to manage more people. And so now you're rewarding special effort. You've got an achievement-based system. And the lines of power and hierarchy are absolutely colossal. 
So this is on a major thing. But then what happened? We were talking about this in the holacracy um, piece before. Da da! What happens? You've got control versus complexity. Managers and leaders cannot see the whole picture. They cannot manage and be competitive because it's too complex. There are people at the far end of the organisations, but actual workers who have got a better view on what's happening than the leaders themselves. So, Frederick Laloux's response to this is, right, in the year 2000 now, we have this. We have recognition of the individual, people enabling and sharing skills, and we've got lines of power and communication for the first time after millennia, for the first time, have changed. And this is where Agile comes in, of course. So Agile doesn't work with top-down power because you have to empower people. So NGOs, non-profits, servant leadership is happening. Um, it's all about innovation. It's all about agility. Our problems are solved. But they're not, are they? <laughs> and they're not in many organizations that you might be working in today because let's go back to social constructivism where people are making sense of their reality based on their understanding of the world. On the left-hand side, we have leaders who are making sense of their world at work to meet stakeholder expectations. Leaders are saying, I am in charge and I will make sure we deliver because that's what they think their job is and that's what other people think their job is. So they're still being top down. Then you have in employee communications. That's delegated the responsibility of communications to a group of people who are also meeting their stakeholder expectations. They're saying, Leadership messages are our Bible, and we make employees fit in with that. So they are perpetuating this top-down thing. Does that make sense? Okay, so the role of internal communications is about internal marketing, channel management, strategic advice. That's what they are doing to deliver on their job as best as they know how. That's still happening, even though that's a de definition of that role from 1975. And we talked about employee engagement. Employee engagement, apparently, according to Aon, uh, in 2017 was 65%. Doesn't sound too bad, does it? But that's the number of employees who said they were even partially engaged. Now, if you're not even partially engaged, you're not probably there anymore or not for much longer. If you take the number of people, excuse me, who said that they are fully engaged, that number is only 27%. So in any given organization, you ask people, who is fully engaged with this job? Only 27% of them will go, I am, which isn't that high. Now I'm going to run another exercise, very quick one. I want you to all stand up. There's a reason for this, please all stand up. People are going, oh God. Yeah, well, it's a top down, it's a top down order. <laughs> All right, I want you to stay standing if you agree with this statement. Do you have ideas and views about the organization you work for? If you really don't and you're not engaged, just sit down, it's fine. Stay standing. Are you able to share these ideas with your boss and other leaders in the organization? Be truthful. Help me make my point and sit down now, Jacob. No, I know, yeah. Do you think your inputs are making a difference? Okay. Well, you're in an agile world, so I would have thought that it would be quite positive like this. Thank you very much. You can sit down now. This is um, really about the fact that if you sat down... So... People basically go at work, to work, to feel understood and connected and valued. Let's face it, that's why they go to work. They want to make a difference and feel valuable. If that's not happening, they'll be on this side of the screen. If that is happening, they're more likely to be on the other side of the screen. So I just want you to reflect on whether you stood up and whether you sat down, and where you are, how far you are over there. On, on that continuum. Okay. So now I'm going to go into um, a part about how to clear the fog. But first of all, I'm going to talk, clear up a 
misalignment. A lot of people thinking about, think about alignment as being the extent to which employee goals match up with organization goals, and if that's the case, everybody's aligned. But that doesn't really address the problem that we're talking about, because you can still have that on paper, but yeah. So this other kind of alignment we could call social alignment. I mean, that's a term that's not official, but we could call it that. And that's when people have a compatible outlook on their shared challenges. They don't need to agree or say the same things. In fact, the definition of social alignment that we could pick up from the literature is that it's about appreciating other people's views, being aware of other people's views, finding the compatibility towards the shared goals, and not necessarily agreeing. You don't get much innovation if you all agree. But the misalignment, um, again, is about whose role is that? So what's the point of that? And a lot of people say, well, you know, that's the role of the line manager. That's the role of the team leader. But here's the thing. They have got a role to frame up the objectives. What are our KPIs? Um, all of those things that we were hearing about in the keynote earlier. Um, what are we here to do? Whose job is what? Et cetera, et cetera. And that's very much a briefing role. But alignment is different. You can't tell people to align. You can't brief them on alignment. So here's the situation, I'd like to now brief you and we're all aligned. That doesn't happen. Alignment is, is recognizing that people have different ways of looking at things and need to communicate on a two-way basis in order to make sense of things in a compatible way. So how can the line manager do that when they've got their own biases and their own views of the world and they've got their own ways of looking at things um, and they don't have any tools to do it? It's, it's almost impossible to ask line managers to just go and get people aligned. And we're talking about moving from this old-fashioned alignment to this alignment, which is more agile. And we move into, uh, what's this got to do with agile? Um, and if you are aligning people and hearing their views and having them be understood and having them make sense of things on their own terms, it's a more open and respectful and inclusive culture so that you've got those behaviors available. Uh, there's more ownership and engagement. The team is more effective because their decisions and actions line up. There's better performance and there's more feedback going up and down the organization. So this is almost a view of the world that doesn't say, that says, well, you know, holacracy, by the way, is totally inspiring. But if you don't have a holacracy, there's a better way of reframing what is the leadership role, which is to be more enabling rather than controlling so that people can make more decisions and align and make more de um, take more actions themselves. So in Agile, you're already doing this. If you already have a team practicing Agile, you've got all of these different methods at your fingertips to help people stay aligned. Agile, to me, is actually just a really advanced two-way set of communication tools that you're using. And when I started to read more about this and find out more about it, I'm you know, really impressed because there's a lot of organizations who say they're doing really well on communications that aren't doing any of this, and this is what makes a lot of sense. You know, retrospective, wheel of values, um, refinement, vision, etc. And then even when you are aligned, there's all of these stand-ups and retro and uh, shared responsibility and two-day conversation, day-to-day -day conversations with the product owners. But let me just start on a really simple level, on four things that people can proactively do as individual people to get more aligned with their team. And the first one is um, actually getting alignment on the map. Very often, teams of people who haven't thought about alignment very much will not be aware of the differences. You'll often see somebody walking around in a team very confident because in their minds, they're completely aligned with everything, so everything's fine. But it's, if you're aligned, if, you're, if you feel comfortable with everything, everything makes sense to you, you're still in a team and you depend on each other to deliver. Um, so it's actually just people being aware that uh, the fog can exist, even though somebody, for, for one person, maybe they feel it really doesn't. Um, the second thing, of course, is talking to leaders about the balance of leading alignment and agile. So these are simple things. Um, that an individual person can do. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's it's a starting point. Put it that way. Um, and again, it's about talking about how leadership and empowerment can work together. Another thing is about looking at those alignment behaviours we're talking about: openness, respect, inclusivity. Maybe you're having a conversation. Somebody's not speaking up. So, what do you think about this? Bringing them in. 
And then there are a range of tools and interventions, and some of the more established ones are, you've already got in Agile, but are about storytelling or conversation cafes, huddles, interventions. And um, I'm going to go into a quick exercise before going into a, one of those interventions, which is about that team test that we were talking about. And I'm going to put you into the role of the facilitator on some results of a team test. But first, um, I'm going to show you on the screen two sets of behaviours. A behaviour A and a behaviour B. And I'm going to ask you to think about which one have you experienced most in your career to date. It just gives you a handle on what kind of environments have you been working in. Okay, behaviour A on this one. People accommodating views they don't agree with everyone, every now and again, just to win points. Or people being curious to understand alternative ways of seeing things, even when expressed using different words and ideas. So really think, which one have you seen more of in your world at work? So if it's behaviour A, put your hand up. So I'm assuming everybody else is going to say behaviour B. If it's behaviour B, put your hand up. Maybe you're not sure. Now, obviously, behaviour B is a bit more time-consuming and a bit more advanced. Um, and it takes a more forward-thinking organisation to look at that. But still, here's another one. Behaviour A is people handling conflict by authority or negotiation. Or behaviour B is people trying to find bridges between different perspectives as a source of innovation. So, behaviour A, who's more familiar with that? And behaviour B? See, yeah, this is really good. If I talk to people who are not in Agile, most of it would be behaviour A. So I think, you know, Agile is about this openness, respect and inclusivity. Now, there's one thing I want to ask you about before we go into it any further. And there's eight points that I've got around what makes an effective dialogue. And I want you to just tell me what you think makes a great dialogue. We'll see if we can get to eight, but whatever. Um, so that we can... Because... You know, if, if most of this is about effective communication, it is about effective dialogue. So what does make an effective dialogue? Just anyone shout out. Yeah. Open questions. Open questions. Good. Listening. Yes, yes. Sorry? Joking. Empathy. 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 Thinking about what the other person is feeling. Intent. Intent. Asking and telling. Asking and telling. Understanding from another perspective. Yes, very good. Clear on the objective. Excellent. Not letting it wander too much. Good. Yes. Being completely clear and honest and open. Anything else? No. Okay. Well, the points that I had actually were speaking for yourself, not as a representative of other people. Treating everyone as an equal, I think we've pretty much got that. Being open, listening with curiosity, even if you disagree to start with. Searching for assumptions. This is difficult. It's not easy to, 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 to mindfully apply yourself in this way. Uh, searching for assumptions by asking why, and asking the other person why. Well, why do you think that? And as soon as you start asking those questions, then you start getting assumptions that people weren't really aware of. They're just below the level of consciousness that then they can be, can be changed immediately if they know about it. Trying not to rush or interrupt. Remembering no single person has the truth. There is no truth. It's just a view. Uh, being brief, sticking to the point, yeah. And, and then finding areas of compatibility. All right, so I'm going to give you an example of an intervention around team alignment. Um, it's for all functions and sectors, so I'm mainly thinking outside of the IT function, actually. The more experience that with, we get with this, the more we're able to um, compare what alignment looks like in different contexts. And context is everything. Um, and it is specifically aligned to just identify and close alignment gaps. So the first thing it does is actually captures perception on learning behaviours by asking questions to measure how much of those four learning behaviours are present. So the first, so for example, a question on psychological safety would be, we treat everyone as positively and as equals. And we ask people to rate that on the scale of one to five. And then if you put the group results together, you can get a view of how much of those behaviours exist within the team. So we're not looking at individual behaviours, 
We're looking at how the team behaves as a unit. And on interdependence, the reliability one, that would be about it's easy to ask team members for help. So we can come up with an actual percentage score on each of the of each statement and in each category as well, and then as a whole. Then we capture perception on context. How do you do that? Well, you ask open questions. What words do you think your customers and stakeholders would use to describe your team? So maybe you could think about that for a second. How do other people perceive, how do they perceive you? So we get words like busy, expert, proactive, um, disconnected, um, negative even. You can get all sorts of words coming up that really does hold up a mirror. What do you think is happening within your organization that will have an impact on your team? Now, if everybody says the same thing, there's some alignment, but is that slight like group think as well? Do you want to check that? There's usually more than one thing going on. If everybody is saying something completely different, why is that? It's a discussion. Um, and then another question, for example, what's your biggest concern for this team? And you would have a key at the side as to what those concerns are. In this case, um, this was a small um, consultants that, that we did, and 43% of people on the team said that their biggest concern was viability. Now, they no normally wouldn't have said that. So asking questions in a very objective way enables the issues to go on the table safely and constructively. Because when you play the data back to the team, you can put that on the table. These are the biggest concerns. You're not pointing the finger at anybody. Individually, the data, the data is anonymous. But isn't that something to put on the table for a team? What would have happened if they'd never talked about it? That's just not, you know, it's too big. We can't talk about that. So this is a way of closing gaps, some of which can be very sensitive. And like I said, when we play that back, it's just because we're able to put put it all in an organized way into a report that visually shows where the gaps are. So you can actually, by asking the right questions in the right way, you can identify the gaps and then put them on the table to close them or at least get some more awareness around what needs to be done. So that gap, those that report will include things like summaries of perceived purpose and perceptions of context, top five behavioral strengths, bottom five, bottom five behavioral um, scores, um, breakdowns of scores, feeling about alignment, positivity, and preparedness. So it's really rich data about actually what is going on in this team? Are there any questions so far? Okay. But the real bit is about not just playing back the data to the, to the team, of course. Are there any seats at the back over there? I think there's a couple over there. Yeah. And there's one there. Um, it's not just about holding up the mirror, so the process is called mirror mirror by the way. It's not just about holding up the mirror and saying to the team, by the way, did you know that this is what you're all thinking and feeling? Which a team normally wouldn't have time to even look at. It's about doing something about it and that we've, I've talked about that. It's about what's best practice dialogue. How do you get them into a discussion to, to close the gaps without it turning into a difficult process and making it as efficient as possible. So this whole thing, um, doesn't last very long. I mean, on one hand, you've got a full picture, really in-depth version, which is about one hour of interviews and survey per person, the report, a workshop of about four to six hours, and then an action plan. But you can do a quick version as well, which is a 20-minute survey with an overview report and a two to three hour workshop. So it's really short alignment. And some of the benefits about that, so one of the comments on this um, presentation slot was about benefits. And what we ask people about immediately after the workshop is, um, how do you rate um, the level of positivity in the team afterwards? How do you rate the level of clarity in the team? And how do you rate, rate the level of preparedness in the team? And only one of these is actually really important. The only one that counts is the level of preparedness. Because during the workshop, they might have discovered things that they didn't really want to know or that might cause them more work or that might have raised more questions. But they're much better off knowing what those questions are and knowing what the shared reality is 
than being ignorant to it. So the level of preparedness in the team is a much more effective one. And we've got three results here. We've got a result from the team we did at Samsung, a project team we did at a university, and then another one we did at Aon. So people are rating these. And the reason why they're rating those, and this is really the philosophy behind this whole alignment idea, is that when people become conscious of their views and assumptions and mental models, they've got more flexibility to adapt them. Because if you're not conscious of what you're thinking, you can't possibly change it. So it's just bringing things to the level of consciousness. And then when people are able to share their thinking with others in the right environment, in the respectful, open, inclusive environment, they can reach a better shared current rea reality together. And this is what a lot of organizations are missing. They've got the management piece, they've got the corporate communications making a lot of noise over a lot of channels but not being really relevant to anyone. And then they've got individuals trying to make sense of things. So it's this piece in the middle that could, um, uh, that's measurable and repeatable and data-driven, that could replace other things. And then three months later, we asked participants in those teams again, um, do you find that after this exercise you made better decisions and actions? And this, these are the responses, uh, this, this first column here. Um, do you have a more open, respectful culture? Because when you get people starting to think like that, it's difficult, you know, they can go back again quickly, of course. But it does set a tone. So actually, we were quite surprised. Um, does it improve team engagement? And this is what we would really call engagement rather than those engagement scores from, from the annual employment survey. And then does it find, provide useful feedback? Because the rest of the higher up in the organization you can provide this feedback about what's holding, what does the team think that the organization is doing to hold them back? And that can be shared. Um, one from this university project team and one from Samsung to indicate, okay, what happens when they start to look at this with just a short intervention or some of those um, ways of dealing with alignment that I was talking to you about. Okay, so this is the University of Upper Austria. It's the um, it's Applied Sciences and a Master's Student Project Team. There are eight of them. They're in healthcare, social and public management. So this is, this is Agile in a totally different context in a way. Uh, it's a new team, a new project. They've got six months to deliver. Um, equal number of men and women, um, balanced ages, different levels of work experience. So their challenge is to translate a co-living housing concept from Vienna to Linz. And you're thinking, what's that? Well, actually, it's enabling students to share accommodation with elderly people for mutual advantage. And it's, you know, parts of Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, this is starting to happen, and the job of these, stu these students is to see, does it work from one place to another. Now, early on in their project, part of the background to this is that in Linz, it's difficult for older people to find accommodation, and there's more student housing than is required. So that kind of impacts their project quite critically. And when we started, uh, when we did the interviews, one of the first findings that we came up with was that 80% of the students were very positive about their project outlook. All team members said that the team is working well uh, together and is aligned or very well aligned. And there's, there was a 77% average rating for morale. So this is like a month into the project. And then we asked that question. And this is the most important question. It's, what is the purpose of your team? So three of them said, to see if elderly people can co-live with younger people. Another three of them said to develop a new concept for co-living in Linz. And two of them said to find out if the concept from Vienna works in Upper Austria. Now, they're all talking about the same thing, but these are really different, aren't they? Now, it'll be very easy for them to have a whole conversation about their project without realizing they actually have a different objective in mind, or there are three different purposes going on here. They're quite different. So this cross-purposes, ironically, conversation can happen all the time because they're using words like, yeah, but when, but how can we do this and how can we make sure that elderly people... They're, they're using words that make them feel like they're on the same page, but they're really not. 
When we ask the question, what do you think your team should do next? These kind of disconnects on the purpose get magnified. And so, we, and so all of these things, you know, communicate with other people, uh, we should rethink the plan, we should be aware of the facts, do more research. Most people, 36% said, we're not sure. And the reason they're not sure is probably because the conversations they're having with other people aren't quite hitting home because everybody's talking across purposes. So the simple story is that we discussed the common grounds and the differences. We put this data in front of them. They captured their ideas and they together agreed revised actions and deadlines going forward. But they think, said things like, you know, it's important to address these things even though they might, not, they might already seem clear. And Mirror Mirror helped me reflect on a lot of important tasks from, from different points of view. Okay, so I'll now take you to this Samsung case study, which is slightly more complex. So you've got 15 teams and three sub-teams. They've got various generalist and specialist roles. They're all del delivering logistics services. And they're broad diversity in age and education and nationality and longevity. You've got some people who've been in the team for like does 12 years or more and other people have just started. So this is slightly more complex because the situation was that ongoing change, including the recent sale of their printer business, meant that the work loan would reduce by 50%. Despite reassurances that there would be no redundancies, the team felt deflated. They felt like um, they would 50% of them would lose their jobs because otherwise it doesn't make sense. So the HR manager created an innovation day to create a new, um, so that she can involve staff in creating a new role. And knowing that innovation doesn't happen when team alignment and positivity is low, the HR manage, manager decided to do something about it. So the situation is that she's saying people are closing down rather than learning and developing. And, that, and the team leader is saying that if the team can grasp the fact that they can take a lead on exciting logistics projects, then we're halfway there. We need their leadership, their drive, and their inspiration. So interviews took place, the data was presented, they did a workshop, the results. Again, we've got this kind of false positivity from the outset. So if you were a leader and you were going to move into this team, you would probably see this, you know, everyone says the team is working well together, 90% say they've got the resources they need, and you know, most of them have got fairly high morale. But if you look under the surface, of course, 88% feel the team is not or is somewhat aligned. 67% thought that redundancies were likely, even though they were told again and again that the redundancies were not going to happen. And 56% felt negative. So, first insight. People are trying to make sense of their situation in the absence of information. So we know this happens. Even in neuroscience, they're telling us that. Um, so they're, they're told nothing will change, but they're finding it difficult to believe. So there's confusion on the future of the team. They're missing a stretch goal. They've been in limbo for months. They're waiting for these new projects. So timing is everything. You can't keep teams held in a uh, limbo situation when, um, you, when you're not informing about what the future is or giving them more stretch goals. So they're waiting for energy, they're waiting for inspiration, and the energy is just running really low. And then finally, something that surprised them all. So this is an example of an alignment gap that will occur that nobody will have spotted. People are saying that knowledge and experience is not being shared, which is being seen as a dependency risk, as a source of inefficiency, and as a blocker to professional development and innovation. So again, it's the kind of insight that is affecting the team, but is, unless it's surfaced, it's just going to keep eroding their performance. So after the results, um, and after they were able to just talk about this together, they felt better, they were more positive, and they were better prepared to succeed effectively. Um, and they're saying, you know, it's interesting to see these insights and be honest with each other. And it's a real game changer for a lot of teams when they come to um, actually talk to each other properly for the first time, probably. So in terms of clearing the fog, we were talking about the team test. Now, the team test is a free online automated tool. It's got 26 behaviors. It's all uh, questions. They're all about behaviors. So you can go ahead and, and take that test. It needs to be initiated first. So somebody needs to set up the, the test so that we can generate a unique link for your team to answer the questions and get the report. 
Um, I'll show you the results of some of the tests that have already been taken. Um, but for now, I'm going to give you some data on what the report looked like and ask you to step into the role of facilitator in terms of, well, what do you get from this data? And it's, it takes a little while to get into, okay? Um, I'm going to show you some sample report data on the screen. I'm going to ask you to look at that data and say, well, what is it telling us about alignment? And then ask and think about then what, would you, what advice would you give? So here's the situation. We've got a team of seven people. It's a US leadership team in HR consulting. So it's a completely different environment. Um, there's a new CEO on seat. It's a long established market leader company, but things are changing. Notably in HR specifically, AI has got technological advances that mean that a lot of HR processes are moving along and into that. And the, com the marketplace is way more competitive. So this is really critical background information. It's a tra traditional HR consultancy, and they're moving into change. So I've got four slides of data that are about to come onto the screen. I hope you can see the screen properly yet. Um, I'm going to show you these slides and ask what you notice about the alignment one by one, one slide at a time, and how the data relates to the background. Because it's amazing what can come up. OK, so here's the first slide. The question was, what is the purpose of the team? So have a quick read of this. And then I'm going to ask you if you can see it. What do you get from that? No, it, it is a qualitative open-ended question. Yeah. We have to have it like that because it's a discovery question. Okay. Most of it seems like oriented towards the client. Yeah, there are only two responses that don't talk about the customer. Yeah, so it's fairly customer focused. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite vague. So all of the, you know, to, well, the second one specifically, to service the needs of our clients. I mean, anyone could say that. So it's really not that context oriented and it doesn't say at all what they do. Would they not assume that since they're part of the same team, the same operation, that you that? Well, yeah, but that's an assumption. So the, the whole thing about asking them to articulate the purpose of the team would be to ask them to be specific about it. So, I mean, if you were going to go in to facilitate this team and take this data to them, you could use this as a, as a reason to iterate this again, to be more specific and surface those assumptions. Because, I mean, who knows what's behind, what they're, what's behind the thinking? Anything else that you're reading from this? Yeah, there's nothing there about employees and, and orientation there. There are two, two here that looks like they've been, well, it looks like they're, it's a sort of message that they're just re repeating because they've learned it. I mean, maybe you'd want to see something like um, to take advantage of technological technical opportunities and uh, to become more effective, more competitive um, in providing HR services to our clients, for example. But they, they don't look like they're really facing up to, to a, a real purpose here. Yeah. Yeah, to be really specific about what are we here for, you have to get quite specific. I mean, it can, the words can be too long, of course, and you've got to make it brief, but there, there's a lot missing here. Yeah. Very vanilla. Very vanilla. Yeah. But it's amazing. Um, I, I mean, I'm not going to say that uh, we, looking at this, are above everybody answering this question. But you get a lot of teams who you ask this question to, and they, they will 
come up with a, a statement because they, they're in it all the time and this is the whole point they're in their reality all the time and you can you sometimes you can't see the wood for the trees so it's very easy for people to put down something and to them those words mean something but to read it alone is a very different meaning so you've got to get people to be much more specific yeah really vanilla quite startling if you if, quite startling for a leadership team okay I'm going to go for the next slide. This is more complicated. Uh, takes a bit more reading. If you want me to read it out, but if you can't read it, I'll read it out. But these are the top five behavior scores and the low five behavior scores from this team. Any insights? Yeah. Since probably the team talks to me that it's good at execution, but they probably have to do a lot in changing the environment. Yeah, they seem to be really high on, really good on process and structure, but are they running in the efficiently in the wrong direction? Is the question. Yeah. The top half seems to be in conflict with the feedback in the bottom half, or vice versa. I mean, if, if somebody says they are all coming at the end of the success and they have only given 49%, then yeah. some of the top bracket feedback is not consistent. But this is why the discussion is essential, because we're committed to each other's success doing what? We're committed to all being silos, and everybody, and we're committed to... Um, being clear on how we differentiate our roles and, um, and how much we show up for meetings and put hours in. What does commitment mean here? So, you know, it's the ability. So, let's say, take these three, uh, these, these ones. They don't want to make a mistake. So, it's the US. They'll probably get told off. <laughs> They're careful not to, um, they're not very good at accepting different views. Um, and they can't really bring up difficult issues and questions. So maybe they're, they're not in the right environment to, to change. Psychological safety? Yeah, there's no psychological safety in the room. So even if they were thinking something, they probably wouldn't say it if it's different, which is preventing them. The say that again? They're not questioning the status quo? Yeah, they're not questioning things because they're not allowed to. That's their culture in their team. Um, so all of these are about appreciation of diversity and inclusiveness. And they're not going to be able to change much if, if that's their low scores. And those scores are quite low, actually. Um, we constantly look out for changing and what that means. But how are they translating that into reality. So they're probably aware of the, the opportunities to get into technology. They're probably aware of this and that, but they're, they're really tightly stuck into their roles and responsibilities as they were. Any other thoughts on this slide? By the way, this average score for behavior for this team was 66%. And sometimes you get a score for a team that's like, you know, 79%. And they think, oh, that sounds great. We, we don't need to do any work. But that does mean that nearly a quarter of the time, they're actually preventing themselves from being effective because they're not, their behaviors aren't, aren't optimized towards effectiveness. So 66% sounds okay, but, you know, I, I, I don't think it's like, there's a, there's a lot that could be done there. Okay, so this slide's a lot easier. This is a question that says, what do you think needs development in your team? Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So vision and goals, if you put those two together, they're all saying we need better vision and goals, but they don't feel the, they don't feel that they, so they don't feel they've got that. So they're kind of aware of it. And like you said, processes, they don't need any attention to processes because they're already really structured and they already have that down pat, right? Um, but the, the relationships one's pretty big. And that's probably because they feel they can't really talk to each other properly. But it's amazing the number of teams who are in this situation. Okay, I'll just give you the last slide now. So this is key opinion ratings. Clarity, alignment, preparedness, pride and positivity. This is what we ask people to rate on a scale of one to five. Any observations? Yeah. Yeah, and if they're not facing up to that lack of clarity, they might individually say, yeah, we've got clarity. In my world, in my blinkered world, I have clarity. So this doesn't necessarily represent the amount of clarity in the team. It's what people are saying they feel clarity on as individuals. And so it's important to know that difference. So 3.3 is higher than I would have thought. If they were fully aware of all of their gaps and all of the alignment issues in the team, then this, this clarity would probably be low because they'd be more aware of it. Anything else? OK. Well, there is. Right. So what we see is that, especially with a strong brand, and especially with a company that people feel proud to work for, pride is something that represents reputation earned from the past. So you could be sitting in, let's take any, name a big top brand that you'd love to work for. Citigroup. You could be sitting in a leadership team in Citigroup while they're falling over the edge of the cliff, feeling really proud to be working in Citigroup. So here, they've got a history of being the market leader at HR services and their pride is rock solid. You know, we can't possibly fail. We are HSK. So they've got a great brand, um, but they're not so positive in reality. Why aren't they? Why, why is their Why is their positivity lower than their pride? They know something's up. This thing about alignment with the organisation, four point one. So that's really high. So either they're deluded or the whole organization is falling off the end of the cliff because they're not. The whole organization doesn't have the, doesn't, isn't giving them the, the framework of the vision and the um, purpose that they can follow. So this needs a discussion. I mean, you can't, you can't be completely, uh, you can't draw hard and fast conclusions from this data, but it, it can tell a story that opens up a big discussion about where is this team and what does it need to do to succeed right now and quickly. Is there anything else anybody wants to say about this slide? Well, yeah. Yeah. And there's a new CEO, isn't there? So this CEO has filled this in, is looking at this probably for the first time, so it's quite a useful tool for a new person to come into to be able to see all of this. And then the new CEO will get a will get a lot from this. And if they're if they're worth their salt, they'll they'll be making quite a lot of changes. Um, but yeah, this is probably from their legacy, <coughs> legacy data. Um, so we've done 41 teams on this particular tool. It's quite new so far. We've mostly in the private sector, mostly at the operational level. Overall, everybody got a 61% score. So again, you know, Probably they did it because they felt they needed to. Um, the average level of preparedness that we found was 54%. Uh, average level of pride was 71. Again, they're proud to be in the team, but it's not right. 
Um, average level of positivity that we found in all of these teams um, was 67%. So again, it's the same sort of pattern, this slightly lower level of positivity to pride, but pre preparedness really low. <laughs> so how much can they face up to that? Um, so you can do the team test at any time with a team if you want to. Um, there's the URL is on the last page of the slide that will be available. Um, and I just want to kind of summarize right now because we've been looking at quite a lot of stuff. It's probably been much more um, on the, uh, out, much less about IT than, than you might have thought. But we kind of, we do see our context differently. You've probably seen this slide before. Who has seen this slide before actually? Such a good slide. I mean, everybody's got a different perspective for a good reason, not just because they're individually different. But they are, of course, individually different. Everybody's got these different personalities. So this isn't about actually saying everybody needs to know it, the personality profile of everybody else. We don't believe that that's a necessity unless the team really needs to be close together. We just People just need to know that everyone's different. And then there's this last one about how we interpret signals. I wanted to, to look at this um, because we can easily see that one of these group of circles is concave. But this is something from a neuroscience exercise that basically says the only reason why pe we perceive one of them as concave. Pardon? Because, because the sun. Because the, we, we, we're used to believing that the sun comes from above. Therefore it is. There's no sun in this room. The light isn't coming from up here in this room. We're pre-programmed in so many ways. We haven't, our brains haven't matured. We're all quite familiar with that concept, but this is a really good one to illustrate it. Because even though we're in a room with light from, different, from the side, we still see it in the same way. And this is the whole flight fight and how we, how we operate, how our brains operate in, in the working world. Uh, so there's a couple of quotes I've got here. One is um, from the execution and the discipline of getting things done. Execution is a systematic way of exposing reality and acting on it. And so, we think it's really important to expose the gaps in alignment and close them as a critical part of performance and team effectiveness. And the learning process starts with an awareness of what is. So um, I can take any questions if you've got some, and that's the end of my presentation. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, I think if you've got a, a team that is new, it's probably best to wait until one or two months later because then they've already just about got their handle on what they think the situation is and it can be changed rather than coming in from a fresh. Um, if you've got a team that is having performance issues, then any time. Yeah, I mean, as long as as long as a team is aware of what is this exercise that's going to happen and how does it work, what do they need to do and what's their role in it, it's just an exercise like everything else. And so the process of clearing the fog needs to establish their participation uh, in the dialogue process more than anything else. But that starts with what is best practice dialogue. You have to participate. They do, and the more a culture within a team or a wider organization shows them it's okay um, to say what they want, per as a personality they may well be quieter, that's true, um, but if they want to participate they can't just completely hold back. And so it's not something that can happen straight away unless, for example, they're given permission and they're, they're asked to comment on their views. And what we do in the workshops is we have small dialogue groups and in those dialogue groups of three or four people, it's quite difficult for a quiet person actually just to hold back because they're in a small dialogue group and it's much safer to talk in that environment. So it's just kind of working with what is.
give the team test and find out the line that you choose. Are there any structured patterns to tag them or you know, what in what context other than well, yeah, it's a bit like the holacracy thing in the sense that in that unique team context, with that unique team, these people are being employed to do their jobs and they have the experience and the competencies to do that. They also need the experience and competencies to say, okay, here we have a problem or here we have a challenge. How can we resolve that? So because everything's unique, it, it is up to the team. So the person who's coming in to, to run this is purely facilitating. They're not going to come in like a bunch of consultants normally do and say, okay, we can see that from this data, your team need to do this, 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 and this. No, I, I got that, but I was just saying from your... Yeah. Have seen some patterns that work in some context? Well, just having them write down what could we do, what then shall we agree to do and who's going to do it and by when and create that action plan of actually, well, we should do this differently because it only leads to actions and decisions. So to capture the actions and decisions, talk them through um, and park the ones that can't be resolved. And that's, again, it's a meta process rather than a, um, an answer. Okay. Well, I hope you've enjoyed it. You can come and talk to me with any more questions if you want to. And uh, thanks very much for listening and for your time.